but summary from here with Chaz talking about open source hardware. Yes. Okay. Okay, so I have a little um, sheet thing I might have sent to you on my server. Um, I'm trying to log in on the one web page. I pretty much just went to chat GPT hmm. to give me some ideas for certain questions. Oh, yeah. um, I'll try to find it right here real quick. If it, okay, here it is. Um, but I'm going to be working on my open house party kits this weekend um, with a friend. Um, let's see if I can get this. Um, but right now I want to focus on open source ecology. It's been a while. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I'll just, how have you been in general? Yeah, long walk to freedom here. This is the last, you know, the enterprise development part of getting product out to high quality. I mean, still finishing it given the latest delays here. But this year we announced the apprenticeship. And now we're getting serious much more in depth, and that's going to be actually a four-year program. So we're getting excited about that. When you were saying about products, were you focusing specifically on the house product or a bunch of products in general? Specifically the house product, the CD Cajon and all its iterations from the standard model at 1,300 square feet to any size, smaller or larger. Awesome. Yeah. Um. If you, I'll let you lead if you want. Otherwise, I got a, a whole bunch of questions. I think about 12 of them. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, just to, to kind of set the stage for uh, the kind of general mission, I mean, it's always been to, once again, we're not, this is not a, not a, any kind of a diversion from the Global Village construction set. In fact, the, the, the home is one of the, actually one of the 50 machines. So that's, that's one, of the, one of them. Now the idea behind the home is to get a single product, which is the CD Go Home, to a high level of development that it's, it's a robust business model that then can, can then fund the rest of the development. So when we start the apprenticeship, there'll be a work opportunity as well. And given the, the quality of the house, we're, we're aiming to bootstrap the development there. So, so as in finishing everything else, based on the solid product release. So that's that's the general idea right now. And still, the as you may be aware of, the 2028 deadline of finishing everything in time, yes, still there. Time's ticking. That's like four years. And, yeah. we're, <laughs> and realistic numbers, I mean, the latest reality check on any kind of development is that for, for any single development product of significance, it's at least a million dollar budget. So in within four years, we're gonna to have to get our hands on fifty million dollars. Now, does that sound crazy? Yeah, it sounds pretty crazy. Sound we're crazy. looking at uh, scaling the house product. Uh, once we get the the model working with twenty four people, so a twenty four person crew building a single house in a period of five days. We are tracking the hours very explicitly. We're at about 1,200 hours for one build of the 1,300 square foot model. And with that kind of rate, I mean, of course, there's a whole big, I mean, we've never done like one a week, right? We've done it, we've done prototypes that took, took about a week and then we had to spend a long time finishing that. But now to get this hit after hit, uh, build after build to get it regular and to train the people that are a consistent team, there's a, some significant challenges there. That one of the main, main challenges is gonna be the learning curve. I'm going to slow you down right there. Yeah. Um, on Zoom, I think I only have 40 minutes, and I'm yeah. assuming you only are going to have time for me for one hour. I have uh, 12 questions, and I definitely want to touch yeah. on a lot of stuff you're talking about. Yeah. Just go ahead um, just a little preview to what's coming. No, that's fine. Up. Yeah. Um, so on the chat GPT, I had a number of questions, and it'll touch again on a bunch of stuff uh, you're talking about, kind of interrelated with the... Uh, the program I'm trying to run. Yeah. Um, one of the first things that was Chad GPT prompted me to ask you is a background and inspiration. How did you identify the need for your workshops or services in the community? I'm putting in relevancy um, and then also quotes like whether it be locally, internet community, or other definition of community. Because I know um, you guys have a lot of big goals, but you also have to be able to kind of sell your program and get that financial sustainability. And so how do you kind of find your niche as far as all the stuff that you want to do, just like there's a lot of stuff I want to do, but where you're able to kind of sell people as far as like, this is what value we can provide. And if you participate in our program, 
or stay in touch with us and do this. Like this is what we are offering as far as like services or products um, as part of our program developments. And um, being I'm trying to do my own workshops, I'd really like to know how uh, some of your success or failures, which I'll ask another question. So back to the first question, um, how did you identify the need for your workshops or services in the community? Uh, can I answer for the CE goal? Because that's sure, yes. Okay, so during COVID time, we were doing a lot of the steam camps with 3D printing and all other various technologies. But when that hit, that was shut down and I asked myself, what is the most important single product or single point of impact we can have? And we know that that is housing. One, it's because that is the single highest cost in any person's life. And that's basically it. That's the, that's the main reason. If we can address housing at a substantial level, then we can have freed up massive amounts of human potential. Uh, if that is the single largest cost in one's life, how much, how much of one's life does one take to, to secure that big need? So, I mean, you can talk about a lot of different products, and in general, the idea is to make life easier with the amazing technology that exists. Now, if we do it through some product, well, that sounds kind of like, just, just a disclaimer, that sounds like a kind of a techno-utopian dream, and that's always what uh, the hippies and now uh, Silicon Valley talks about in, in terms of, okay, we're going to create new widgets to solve problems, right? But we believe that nobody's working on, a, or, or very few people are working on an essential approach to changing the world, which is, which is the distribution of wealth. The distribution is, of wealth is not going to be solved by somebody developing some technology. It's not going to be solved by us developing the CD Eco Home unless we do it in a particular way. So it could happen with any product, but it, it would have to happen in a particular way. And that's simply distributive. That as we go through this, we truly distribute economic power. We distribute true education. We just distribute democracy like solving um, one of the key issues, which, which in our view is the distribution of wealth. That's one of the frontiers in a big scheme that we're trying to solve. May I interject for a bit? Yeah. So um, my program is Open House Party, mm -hmm. and so that kind of ties in with your CD Eco Home, Wiki House's housing development. Mm -hmm. um, I felt, I've found in my life um, I've kind of wanted to focus on the uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Exactly. And so the house that you're discussing is one of those key things of the base fundamental as far as shelter. Yeah. And other things I think you guys touch on is like food as well with ecology. Um, so in my mind, um, with my program, I'm trying to kind of care or uh, acknowledge organizations like yours or WikiHouse or um, Precious Plastic. But also um, I found, uh, at least in the US say, we have certain laws or legal systems for like a high deductible health plans or health insurance or other incentives um, as far as to support need-based um, organizations, such as like a donor advice fund that's like tax deductible to put towards uh, certain public service areas. And so I'm trying to find ways as far as kind of bang for a buck or the ma most impact that's with our current legal system as well, or just for self-development, because there's the one aspect of the house, the physical product, but there's also the body house per se as far as like either nutrition or like health well-being and there's a lot of things even though i've gone to college there's a lot of things i hadn't been aware of as far as health insurance or in regards to finances mm -hmm. or i'm right now i'm kind of finding out things with like the legal system and public resources yeah and so um through part of uh, this program because as you're well aware with your own initiatives it can become very overwhelming and you've got to put a scope to it at a certain point yeah. but to acknowledge other people who are doing very good work in their areas whether it be you in open source ecology with the cd Eco home or alistair parvin i think was um with the wiki house or some people i found online who promote certain types of health insurance um and i can learn about high deductible health plans and stuff from like uh government plans yada yada but I've been trying to kind of archive and filter through some particularly useful resources I have, not just with housing, but just like self-development and just well-being as mm -hmm. far as just creating that base model of state, both with the house estate, but also like personal development. 
Um, so I think you've answered my one question as far as how do you identify the need for your workshops with that COVID experience. Um, we're at 516. I'm not sure how much time I have left, about 45 minutes at best. So I'm going to go into my next question. Um, open, uh, actually, sorry, workshop logistics and operations. What are some key considerations when planning and organizing nonprofit workshops for you and open source ecology? Well, a key consideration is that people have to show up. You have to have you know, something that's good enough that, that attracts people. And um, I think that's it. The, the thing that we learn over time is, I mean, we've done some radical things, some pretty extreme builds, but at all times, it's, it's really, really pushing the limits in, in terms of being ready or marginally ready for it because you always want to do more and you got to scope it. And the problem is that a lot of, like many, many things out there, like we intend to run workshops where there's economic significance and like something that you can build that actually makes it makes an impact in your life it's not entertainment it's not hobbies it's real stuff that can impact your cost of living towards your maslow's hierarchy thing towards self-determination towards i'm gonna slow you down a bit yeah um do you ever consider like acknowledging other organizations like i, I think i've seen a bit of your acknowledging like wiki house and others that do similar work yeah. I know every organization kind of wants to do their own thing yeah. and they have their agendas, but it would be really cool to acknowledge like certain organizations that are good at their niche that can do complementary work and international collaborations, whether together or maybe they've done something in the past and acknowledging that. I know for like my program, mm -hmm. I'm trying to acknowledge a lot of your work and a lot of WikiHouse's work mm -hmm. and a lot of other people's work totally outside my domain. Um, so I guess I want to kind of challenge you as far as I know you're doing some great work with templates and uh, key metrics, but also being able to acknowledge or acknowledge or delegate as far as, hey, they're doing something really good that complements what we're doing. We should like acknowledge this and see if we can do something that they'll also acknowledge that helps the public program in general and broad. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. The... Maybe I'm forgetting to say that we're not creating anything new. We're just taking anything that's available. So you're taking things like RepRap, FreeCAD, Precious Plastic, there's WikiHouse, there's Anything educational like resources from colleges or communities yeah programs. I mean I, I'm not even saying that because that's an assumption that's a built-in assumption the I mean the core value that we have is collab collaboration is open collaboration that's collaborative literacy so and I've also and we're going to interject limits because I mean you're saying you're saying that yeah there's all these great projects yes but how do you have that even better? How can you create infrastructures where all of them can combine efforts so that those products that are actual real releases are not like one ten thousandth of the economy, but actually start gaining traction in hardware, just like software has had. And been. something I want to add in my program as far as edu education, and I've also referred to a lot of your work, is a certain nonprofits or fake open source organizations, right. which I don't want to give any names, <laughs> um, because it, I mean, it does take a lot of money and effort to get things going with a nonprofit or any organization, but it's not in line with the congruency of the ethos of what we understand to be open source. Right. So there's a lot of organ there's a few organizations I've actually referred to from your uh, resources that I want to try to develop some of their technologies, mm -hmm. but there c comes limitations as far as non commercial usage or things that I can only add to their system, but I can't really benefit per se, aside from replicating their thing and adding to their program per se. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I'm just trying to keep in mind to be legitimate, but not incur any lawsuit or anything else, or else uh, step on too many people's toes. Yeah. But I want to acknowledge people as far as good works that they do. Let me just ask, add to that a little bit. What you're describing as the context in which we live, right? And of course, we're trying to get to the next context where in a post-scarcity mindset, things like patents are a thing of the past and trade secrets are a thing of the past because we have actually noticed that there are business models that are much more effective because they have open collaboration. So I actually say that if you want to you scale, yeah, you could do a billion dollars with, with proprietary, but if you really want to change the world, go open source, and that's at the trillion dollar levels. So the next level of startups or movements are yet to happen. And that's, that I believe is going to be open hardware, just, but not, not specifically open hardware as just a shift of mindset to a different paradigm of collaboration, just a different, different playing field. 
where there's enough for everybody and everyone acts like it, not like there's war. So now there's the whole struggle between democracy and fascism and all that. But this thing of openness is part of that big game. That's all I gotta say. Okay, thank you. Um, I only got so much time, so I'm gonna keep um, going through these questions. Um, oh, I guess it was part of the same question. Mm -hmm. um, what indexes or templates or standards do you like to defer to in your own organization? Whether you guys have created yourself with the CD Cajon, or maybe I think you guys have done some marketing and stuff or other templates. When you guys do your workshops and keep the documentation as far as these are our standards, mm -hmm. um, what are some of the big indexes or templates or standards you guys usually refer or defer to when so doing a program? We always defer back to the what we call the development template, and it's effectively the the nutshell about 20 lines or so of what you do to, to go through a, a complete process of open product development. Just product development in general, but specifically for us it's open product development. Now for every single thing we, we like to keep a template as in like, okay, here's how you do a critical path, you know, how, how you plan your work or whatever, uh, template for that. It's, it's very, there's so many of them, like bills of materials or, or calculators or all kinds of things. A very useful thing online you can find is like if you're trying to do engineering or, or do calculations of all kinds of sorts, I mean, there's so many different calculators online and computer tools like FreeCAD even have various uh, templates. You can design templates into FreeCAD, for example, where you can generate, like for example, in a CD home. Right now we're generating the house, the, the actual wall modules using templates. Here's the parameters, you put them in a template and it spits out the real CAD. So it's a, it's, the answer is very long to this question. Yeah, I do know uh, interjection though. With the program I'm going to try to run this year, I'm definitely going to refer to a lot of your works and a lot of WikiHouse's works as far as like standards, whether it be the open source ecology Linux uh, with all the different programs mm -hmm. and also some of like uh, uh, your bill of materials and such. But I have i don't know if you found this relevant, but sometimes I find it for myself maybe in getting others on board is to kind of create a mutual vision. You might start it, but something that's kind of mutually shared with the group for that experience. Um, by the end, to identify the needs and desires of like the group and how the developments of the program meets their needs or desires as you work through this. So everyone's being served as far as their incentive for participating. Yeah. Um, with my program, right now, most of the work has been done by myself. I've had some colleagues and friends help with stuff, but finance has become an issue, of course, to keep people on board. And so right now I'm trying to work on scale models and the goal is to literally scale up, but I want to be able to not just contract work out, but also do my own development. Mm -hmm. or appropriate contracted out but I want to show like at the birdhouse or a doghouse or a larger scale model right now it's easier for me to work through the wiki house system that I'm familiar with they have some other models but I also want to touch it based on uh, your um, models with the CD go home and some of the variations and some of the core models mm -hmm. and refer to um, your resources yeah. I, I'm aiming yeah. to do it's one thing to aim for a monthly newsletter. I might be able to actually hit a quarterly newsletter, but I want to identify like open source ecology or WikiHouse, some of the new updates you guys have, because I can't do this by myself. I can't. Yeah. You, I know you can't do it all by yourself. You can only do so much. But when you refer to your um, your core personnel or other people with their organizations, it makes it for an easier progression or advancement collectively. Yeah. Um, so trying to learn how to let go and let either delegate it or acknowledge, hey, they're doing some amazing stuff right here. I can't stop that. I'm just going to acknowledge like, oh, Martian is just like wowing it with the CD go home. Like, I'm going to acknowledge it in my program and this and that. Mm -hmm. And um, and then hopefully if I have enough earnings to offset expenses, I can like support like with donations or funds to programs that are in sync with what I'm doing and what you're doing, mm -hmm. um, which is what I hope to do over time. Yeah. Um, next uh, question or of sorts, what are some effective strategies for marketing and promoting your nonprofit workshops? I'm going to interject right before you answer that. For me, I found using like the Zephy platform as it's evolving. Of course, there's social media, Creative Common, Commons, and some other nonprofit entities and derivatives. Um, but I've been trying to refer to that sort of stuff. But once again, uh, back to you. What are some of your effective strategies for marketing and promoting your nonprofit workshops? Um, and getting that development, but also like financing of sorts and community engagement. Yeah, I mean, the way we would market the various workshops is basically, it's about, I mean, edutainment or, or educational materials, uh, just publishing 
on social media and everywhere <clears throat> on an ongoing basis. So, so being basically working out loud and through that you engage with people and you have something real to offer because you're saying, oh, hey, this is cool, this actually works and you can do it too, kind of a thing. Now, um, but I will go back to as far as marketing, I mean, it goes back to we're, we're going to have to, I think of marketing as more like funding at this point and that is the, the revenue stream. I mean, you have to get very clear, and I, I'd like to suggest actually the book Good to Great, but what is your economic flywheel? What is that thing that's going to drive your uh, your product improvement by getting the revenue for that and, and so forth? So, so that ultimate clarity and what exactly is your product, how it's unique, and how that generates revenue, that's a key question to a answer. And that's how I, I go about now planning with the future work, I'm saying, okay, here's the business model for the CD go home, here's the hours and labor it takes, here's the product quality, and here's the kind of numbers that I can get. And, and we verified a lot of the production side, and we think that we can market homes at very competitive costs. So, so we think we, we, we've got, got it, and we can grow from that point. So, but yeah, really getting clear on, on the business model is, is key. Okay, I'm going to do another interjection before I go to the next question. Um, but also, I, I kind of wanted to touch like on the experience side. Mm -hmm. um, with open house party, I think of like open house party like electronic music, and there's plenty of open house party music that's available. And so, something that I have an idea for with my program offering is kind of referring to like your organization or wiki house, and just having something like up tempo beat of like music or just like like people who want to really get stuff done as far as getting their life established getting the home established and whether they choose to, part to purchase a product kit or whether they want to partake in like the experience um and maybe i just host like a development digitally of a eco home or a wiki house but eventually they can build up to a full-scale one but i'm kind of curious um i know sometimes when you get in the drudge of things you think kind of more technically like the product or the service, which are both important, but also kind of the services in between, kind of that experience. Yeah. And I know, like over time, you've gotten a bit more finesse and professional as far as how to deliver that and how to get people on board and how to kind of meet those needs of like um, collaborators or um, or people contributing financially of sorts. But what do you? I know that you uh, refer to the secret sauce of open source, but um, do you ever consider of ways to make the experience like? really smooth or a certain kind of like mood set when the process goes because sometimes I know if it's there's not enough support or staff things can get troublesome and I think you guys have sometimes had like either a pool party or playing around with the tractor as part of like the experience with open source ecology what kind of like experiences do you try to integrate to keep people like really engaged and excited and pumped up through sometimes the drudge of the labor work yeah, I mean, it depends exactly what you're talking about. For example, in the workshops themselves, I mean, people love the idea of being with a bunch of other crazy people from all over the world and having a great time at it and in a very supportive environment. That's awesome. Now, as far as the next phase, which is four-year immersion programs, okay, the user experience is that of students. So how, the next question becomes, how do we create the most innovative, interesting, enriching, rapid learning environment? for people to thrive, to really, I mean, we're, we're going far in this. We're saying we're gonna recover genius here because 98% um, of little kids at two years of age are creative geniuses. By the time they become adults, only like 2% remain. That's, that's like, uh, that's studies, that's science, scientific studies, right? So, okay, what, where do we lose it? Where do we lose our, start losing our potential and getting into the scarcity mindset? We're saying, hey, we're gonna teach you to recover that we're going to teach you everything about everything or just scratch to scratch the surface, learn how to think in four years while you're building things. And that's the real hands-on experience. That's, so that, that experience has to be high quality. It has to have an excellent community. It has to have, I think the, the biggest thing if you're in a school thing is you have to feel really empowered by what you're learning, literally transforming your viewpoint of what's possible. So that is the experience that we're aiming for, and anything that supports it, will do it. Perhaps it's it's our uh, extreme uniform of how how exactly do we handle all our tools and the tool belt with that's optimized for the best production or whatever. Like little details like that will all matter uh, towards because the bottom line it has to be efficiency. If you're talking about 
um, effectiveness in the marketplace, you have to be good product. You have to be able to produce it efficiently as well. Have you heard of, um, um, I think it's called maybe Rock Stew of sorts? I have not. I think it was like a thing we did in educate in primary school. Like you put in a rock, and there's a story of like these knights or something else who would need food, so they get everyone engaged, kind of like open source to contribute. And so I want to say okay. you keep the saying that. Like, yeah. So your open mm -hmm. the open source is your secret sauce, mm -hmm. but depending on the community or audience you have, I think maybe something to consider is like zest locally. Do you want to add to the mix? So open source is the foundational ethos, and it kind of depends on the environment and the people involved. But maybe like a, when you're adding some flavoring to your experience, mm -hmm. um, just kind of touching base as far as what the group incentive is for that time, and kind of get some feedback from your participants. That's yeah, something well, I, I let me actually jump up a little bit in perspective. Sure. And that is to say that open source ain't it. It's like that's cool, but that's a, still a fringe thing. Now it's the absolute core. Open collaboration is the absolute core of what we do. But we mm -hmm. don't, that's not exactly how we're going to market it. We're going to market it as we're as the actual tangible impact on your life. The the fact that it's open source, who cares? I mean, I care, but people don't care. So how am I impacting your life? And with impacting your life, it has to be to that element of the financial independence thing or the self determination thing that you're in control of your life. That's the kind of product that we're switching so, so like the biggest I would say the biggest learning on my side is um, in terms of shifting more towards the enterprise development side is that yes the open source theory is great but that's not at present what puts money on the table right it's all the proprietary economy and people cannot jump out of that as much as they want to only very very few can dabble in it and, and love it and be like us and, and make a more significant part of their life but in terms of the actual impact it's going to be product product quality of life improvement just just economic stuff yeah um let me try to go to the next one um how do you measure the success and impact of your workshops for engagement and impact which i shouldn't get all you kind of touched on a bit can i replace workshops with extended workshop of four years which is the immersion apprenticeship Okay. Here. <laughs> how do I measure? So ask it again. Um, how uh, how do you measure the success and impact of your immersion experience or for your program? The impact is going to be that you can build, design, and build anything. Like the absolute empowerment of that, the kind of skill set that you will gain, which also translates to we can hire you. We can hire you because of the rapid learning you've done over the four years, above market rate, very competitive. So you not only get skill sets and mindsets, but something that you can do for a living. So that means making a better world for a living. So that's, how do you measure it? Jobs. I want to interject a little bit. So I think one of the key things with competition is sometimes there's two different mindsets. There's like beat you down, competition and then there's like uh, upbeat competition like everyone wins kind of situation and I feel like as far as with that competition it's just kind of really selling as far as how your once again how your life improves and just the difference in mindset it's not just being someone down it's about how your standards and quality of life with yourself and with others improves not just being the best per se but just like holistically becoming better as far as like a competitive yeah. You're not leaving anybody behind. There's enough yes. for everybody. And that's that's the other uh, key element. Mind shift, mind shift change or yeah. paradigm change. There's enough for everybody. You can include everybody. It's it's the reptilian brain from hundreds of thousands of years ago where we learned to fight and flight psychologically or, or, or physiologically. Our, our bodies haven't changed. But technology has exploded to the point that we make survival a non-issue but our minds have not caught up to that. Okay, um, if I lose you, I'm hoping maybe I can try to catch back in with you just for future reference. And that yeah. 30, 535, um, next question, um, really important question that I'm trying to develop myself. Mm -hmm. We'll see how easy it is for you. Um, how do you engage and involve participants before, during, and after the workshops? Before, during, and after. So <clears throat> before... It's about 
selling an irresistible offer, an irresistible value, like, hey, can you actually do with your life that which is really important to you? That's kind of the, the core pitch. The tools and skills and the mindsets, they all get you there. And during it, it's, it's the empowering learning experience that we have to put in a lot of resources to making that happen. Um, highly integrated learning that's multidisciplinary and integrated includes from hands-on to computers to theoretical and all that and history and everything. And, and learning also starting with a person, starting with personal psychology. How do you, how do you get to this mindset? So it's, it's really peak performance training. And then after, for after, it's like, hey, if you, if you make it through this, we want you. Work with us, you know? Yeah, I want to just yeah, add in. Start a new it, branch somewhere else. Yeah, it's just not just the style of thinking. So you want people to improve upon what you're doing, but also have the relationships with last beyond the workshop experience where they can refer to later or just some, um, or see the developments that you did at one time being touched upon again and advanced further. Uh, just like uh, like modular product design, it's like the relationship should improve with time. Like uh, in our relationships, if we have offered something of value, like why should we not continue to educate that person or work with them, or always keep improving that which we started? Because it's all, as I always say, this is only the beginning. It's like what else is possible? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I got a number of other questions. Um, the next one is, what strategies have you found effective for generating income as a nonprofit organization? Well, we, we did initially crowdfunding, some Kickstarters, but initially it was effectively like, um, I did a thing called a thousand true fans, basically uh, donations that are recurring by producing content and, and being online constantly and reporting on our, our progress with live bills and everything else. That, that migrated to then the workshop model as people actually coming to get that experience because you have to get you have to get that hands-on bit and that's just really important and now uh, seeing the limit of the limit to that is okay people come here but then they go back to work for the man on Monday you know that that thing so to address that the next step is okay well how about this is about life um, life skills and and job like job or on job training you know uh, that you can do on job to career yeah from yeah exactly um, so and and the latter cannot happen at scale without product so hence product and the, the product release the quality of that and also the product ecology fitting a whole like we're, we're not giving up the whole package we're saying okay here's the thing that we can take to a full completion and have the revenue streams from that feedback, the financial feedback loops that are so difficult with open. And that's why everybody that like you talked about fake open source, most people end up quitting after some time. So. Okay. Um, I guess the next question, um, are there any specific funding sources or revenue streams that you have been particularly beneficial for your organization? Um, I can't really speak of any, it's, it depends like, Lo I would say actually local, like maybe local foundations might be a good idea because then you can, if you're doing anything related to hardware, that might be local impact there. But at that same time, we haven't succeeded with that. But we will get, I, I will do some grant writing at this point to fund some of the education part because you know, education is universally liked. I mean, that's, that's a universal product. So we'll see. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, the next question I have is um, related to collaboration and partnership. Mm -hmm. How do you identify, cultivate, and classify partnerships with other organizations or stakeholders? How do we identify is first, it's, what's your license? Is it open source? If that is, then we're in, and then we see, okay, can we use this? Can we replicate it as is? Uh, can we build upon it? And of course, reach out to the individuals doing that for, for collaboration. And at the same time, observing the limits that, given that the tr economic traction of open hardware has not happened yet, a lot of these projects are quite limited, so you can only do what you, what you can. Uh, once again, it goes back to, to the idea of 
um, really doing the business development on one product that we can then share with the rest of the world and, and wish that others could collaborate on, on that because you only need so much effort for a product to be created. Uh, but given the lack of collaborative literacy that people don't see that there's enough for everybody, that's the main link, main missing link there. So that's that's the part we're struggling with, and right now I've kind of been down Periscope for a bunch of time. But yeah, let's see what happens with apprenticeship and when the product is out. How much traction does it get? Okay, and then the next question is for future plans and vision. How do you envision scaling or expanding your workshops or services in the future? And I want to add in sustainably, okay. both in the financial aspect, but also m mission, passion, like keeping up the upbeat attitude that you're yeah. fulfilled. So I'll ask it again, um, how do you envision scaling or expanding your workshops or services in the future? Yeah, so the first thing is to develop the 24 person model which can produce a house in five days. That is radical, that's absolutely radical. It's way faster than anyone in the industry does today. So that is step number one. And upon reaching that, it's a modular unit. So we can think about, oh, okay, now we've got a program of 24 students, apprentices, what about 10x? Can we actually start getting a real campus here to get, to, well, starting with unrolling, accept, unrolling, basically rolling admissions? How quickly can we build up in the units of 24? I think 24 makes a, makes good sense. It's like class size. It's a good significant team that you can get stuff done really fast, or at least the nucleus of that. And then units of that. After that is completed, for us, it's specifically, okay, now are we running a successful campus here? That's one, provides an amazing experience. Into it, you're adding all the sustainability and excitement from things like from renewable energy to aquaponic greenhouses to building your own machines to designing and building your own infrastructures and all that. Um, create a state-of-art place which will take care of the people that are here. And, but that's doable with a lot of resources. And so at the same time as we're generating revenue, we're des developing designs, the essential thing. We, d we work on the things that we can build and implement and use in our lives um, for, the, for the business itself. So scaling from then, I mean, replicate this. Come to the, get trained to build basically civilization construction. Skip forward probably here <clears throat> for a few minutes as Chaz is going to set up another <clears throat> call probably. No.
There we are. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah well, why did I cut off there? I I don't know. At forty four, so probably three minutes ago. Yeah. 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 I had a feeling it was going to happen, but I'm glad you came back. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. There we go. Um, I think I left off at future plans and vision. How do you envision scaling or expanding your workshops or services in the future? I think you're talking about your 24 class cohort of students um, will focus on like the CD go home or some project and um, somewhere around that I cut out. Yeah, well, so the idea there is to 24, we're gonna keep going at the CD go home project. On th the way I envision it right now is get to village scale, which is like 10x, so about 240 people, dedicate all those people to further R&D and builds of the CD go home, to once again, to develop a, an operation at the 240 person scale. How does that look? That looks like a $50 million business to me. Now, from 240 for each project, then you can start talking modularly, develop new cohorts that now tackle, okay, now we're gonna do automation, CNC, or aquaponics or any other softer topics like governance or new money systems <laughs> legal or whatever. I want to slow you down a bit yeah. um, I mentioned before with Open House Party I'm trying to like do my newsletter and acknowledge organizations like yours or WikiHouse of the sorts mm -hmm. and um, I've got also like a little community forum um, with social media um, on free, free flarum and I acknowledge a lot of your work and other people's works with like the CNC technology and open source and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to click, create a repository of obviously like your organization, WikiHouse, but also kind of derivatives off of that in the open source domain. Mm -hmm. um, as far as um, both citing your current links as to your own site, but also referring as my site as a duplicate of your work mm -hmm. and then adding in my own derivatives. Mm -hmm. And I've kind of come to the gray area decision. I'm um, once again between your ethos and stuff with some of the more commercial stuff. As far as at some point, you also have to have funding and see progress. And so kind of my goal I've seen from, uh, I think, Precious Plastic with like Project Camp of sorts is that they have a, a, a aspect of funding where once it's like funded, then they acquire or pursue the project. And so a lot of my stuff, like when I'm repeating stuff in the public domain, like your own stuff, I want to keep an open domain. But at a certain point, I have for a public test on the nonprofit side, I have to have public income, at least of 85%, I think it is. And so in order to pursue other projects, I'm kind of wanting to limit the public domain open source until that funding goal is reached, and then keep it in the public domain forever, per se. So that way I'm doing derivatives and to some extent I'm leaving it in the public domain, but stuff that's like a bit more capital intensive where I have to meet my legal requirements as an organization, um, I'm gonna probably have some stuff restricted until it meets that funding goal and then the designs are fully released if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because um, I, th I don't know what conclusion you come to at sorts, but like there is the ethos you want to uphold, but then there's the finances to remain operational. Yeah, but you gotta go back to, to the initial thoughts of there's no nothing and open it's open is a way of doing business it, it doesn't mean whether you're for like you make money or not you can suck and lose money as a non-profit or as a for-profit <laughs> right so so don't get stuck on that on 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 closedness being the key to your financial success you're just enforcing the the scarcity mindset and we're just we're just fundamentally opposed to that so when whenever you do that you're thinking oh well okay that's the way i could make money but it's not you gotta have product Bottom line part. Now, who's shown it with hardware? Nobody really. Everyone went down south in open hardware. We're still doing it. There's other people still doing it. We're committed to it. We're committed to showing that the revenue model can be shown while you're absolutely transparent in everything, in operations, templates for legal, for everything, business models, not just the product designs, business designs, organizational designs. So I'll challenge you to to think about it that way, it's not the distinction between proprietary versus open that's the key. In both of those cases, 
You have to have good product. With an open route, you gain the advantage of, of ethos or collaboration. In a closed one, you get the advantage of, okay, here's capital, but for what purpose? For the further concentration of capital. And it's like people don't talk about it a lot, but that's the essential thing they're saying. It's like, nah, not interested in making it. It's like implicitly, nah, we're not going to change the world at the fundamental level. We're going to keep it proprietary and exclusive forever for uh, till the end of time. That's an implicit assumption. So it's like, nah, ain't touching that. Okay. I'm most, I mostly agree with you. My only concerns in my mind are stuff of like confidentiality, not with the products, but sometimes disputes with like personalities and stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I've noticed like you've made some comments in your logs of stuff. I'm not... I didn't look that far into it. That is just like my career experience. Sometimes stuff happens and you acknowledge on a general level, but like, um, but some things you don't leave public. So, yeah, um, that's my distinguish, distinguish between privacy and working openly. So yeah, by all means you have to respect private information, private financial information and all of that. Um, but it doesn't mean you, you start acting in a, in a competitive that proprietary competitive way you know you you have to still give due respect for for personal privacy that's a big deal so we're not denying that we're just saying that we're going to work openly in terms of product product and enterprise yeah okay um once again like i'm still a little bit more of a novice compared to you as far as the operations and upkeeping that so that's something i'm going to attempt to but um I'll see how it goes. Um. Yeah, I mean, see, the theory is it's like we're, we're just saying this. Look, the housing market is in the trillions. There's no way ever I'm going to try to capture that myself. It's going to be about how much of that can we distribute. Can, and we, we come up with the idea of distributed market substitution. They call it capturing a market in the proprietary world. We call it distributed market substitution meaning that once you have enough energy go to a certain product that product becomes the best it's kind of like think of it as the apple you know apple computer the, the iphone for everything now the say iphone succeeded very well in, in absolute well mostly cornering that market in an exclusive way we're saying we're going to do the same except the the economic benefit is distributed so yes you have access to the top-notch design and enterprise models but you can go fractal and modular you can create your other organization in Africa or wherever it needs it to bootstrap civilization from scratch the value proposition is much more great just thinking of it like the next scale up beyond proprietary is the world of open and infinite possibility so it, it's, it definitely takes a different kind of a mindset uh, but um, part of this education experience about the quality of it is that we aim to show that one that's possible and here's how you do it we'll take you through that journey and that's that's what we're about okay it's a fundamental mind shift change cultural change leading to economic political change but right now as you see the world the world is pretty troubled right now we're stuck in scarcity land Yes, and I'm just acknowledging for me, like, my only issue is, like, as far as needs-based, like, I don't mind, like, publishing, like, my works and developments. Um, it's more as, like, as long as I can put food on the table and be self-sufficient, I don't mind doing it. But I think for myself and for other people where it gets hard is when they're not able to kind of meet their needs. Well, um, absolutely. So hopefully that's, what's that? Absolutely. So I hope, like, um, as I kind of sift through more of your organization's work, um, I can kind of see how you guys are publicly like uh, addressing some of those stuff and maybe that might be also a good market <laughs> niche significance that's also one that i want to hit on with my own program as far as some like I, i'd like to eventually get my own home and property of course and so i'm trying to do like housing development kits to address that and explore your organization with the house and the other sorts but for now like i still have to do my main job i'm trying to eventually transition to my two enterprise stuff. but right now i'm still kind of referring to someone else's business yeah, um yeah and, that and there's also of, that goes back to you said okay making a living and that goes back to the product yeah you make that product open and everybody can benefit 
And all yes. the people that are now reinventing the wheel, competing with each other hundreds of times over. You know, for any company, you've got like you know, 10 or 100 or 1,000 different companies doing the same thing. Everybody just spinning the, the hamster yeah. wheel. Uh, the economy is extremely inefficient. Yes. In and especially at distributing the wealth of it, of its work. Um. One last spiel, I guess, in regards to that question. Just with like my nonprofit, I've had an operation for about five years or no, now so. Um, for fifth or sixth year, give or take, I need to show I have 85% funding from the public or more. Uh, that can't be too much from me. I've gotten pu funding from pub public, but not to that requirement threshold. So that was kind of my incentive as far as keeping it like limited. As far as once I reach a goal of financing, then it's totally released per se. Um, but that's working with some old archaic constraints legally of sorts um, as far as some of those rules. But my goal is to get more towards open source with you, and I don't want to make too many excuses, but I want to eventually progress to more of that e open source ethos. But there's stuff that happens, and I'd like to acknowledge it with you to get past that eventually. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a real real deal. People got to put food on their table and have a house over there. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to try to go to the next question to... I don't, not take up too much of your time and thank you for the time you've offered so far uh, hopefully it's not more than half an hour if you're willing to keep going for a bit longer yeah just a little bit more mm -hmm. okay um let's try to see are there any other questions i see one i got three more questions on my list if you're all right with that mm -hmm. yeah. um the next one are are there any new projects or initiatives on the horizon for your organization are there any self-imposed constraints to focus on the core discipline of projects? Oh. Well, I like the second one. Uh, new projects is uh, we're full of them. That the fifty global village construction set technologies are still in, and beyond that, there's a level. If you go to the global village construction set page on the wiki, you should link to that. Uh, there's actually what happens after that. So the fifty global village construction set technologies were intended to the point where you can create literally a. A full economy from scratch, right? Well, that's at the basic level, but what about microchips and spaceships and things like that? That's more, more complicated. Or things like states or governance systems and money systems and things like that. So for, for a mere $50 million, you can develop a new civilization. That's that's our next milestone That's that's been been there, except the price ticket has changed from like much lower than that to, to this, I think, more realistic number for the development required to make each of these things pretty robust economic. After that, open sourcing the entire technosphere. That means everything to jet engines and microchips, right? And that, I estimate, there's some calculations you can look at the Global Village Construction Set page, but that I estimate to cost $50 billion. billion. All the knowledge of humanity defined as the value, like, I actually, to get 50 billion, I actually looked at the value that patents provide and every 19 years they expire. How much value is there? It came up with, see if you can poke holes in the argument, but I'm saying roughly 50 billion is what it costs to open source all the knowledge, all the productive knowledge, everything in civilization. So I want to add something. Um, I want to give you a good job or pat on the back. It's been a while since I've checked out your Global Village Construction Set page. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been updated for quite a while, but I'm seeing that there's some updates as far as your GVCS 2.0 and GVCS 3.0. Yeah, that, that'll blow. That, I mean, it's far out thinking, but it's doable. It's doable. It's. I mean, $50 billion, that's like one-fifth of what Apple makes a year. That one um, time is a new kernel of entire civilization, not just like the, the fact that you can create a real economy, uh, say from dirt and twigs, but then go to, go to the stars. I want to add, um, kind of with my program as well, like I was saying, I want to refer to your developments as well as other people's, but I like to acknowledge some of these like milestones that you and other people are doing mm -hmm. with hardware, hardware in particular, also with stuff like software, like Marlin, CNC stuff and all that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really nice to see like some good, serious updates regarding that and you're kind of really focusing on the CD Go Home and some other of those uh, core key technologies. Um, but like a part of like with the program I'm trying to do, um, niching it down on the more hardware side or the bottom of the Maslow hierarchy of needs, 
Um, I really wanted to index a lot of like your works, like with these CD Cajones um, and other core technologies amongst like other organizations. And the workshop I've been working on uh, developing, um, I've got like the precious plastic equipment. I'm trying to do proper maintenance on the equipment outside of work and also kind of get my websites and pages up to date so I can kind of get that engagement point because I've been working on this number of years and it's been a lot to do by mostly myself. Um, but part of that key, as I'm sure you're aware of, is that engagement both in person, but also with your group of people you choose, but also globally, your public face and keeping people engaged to have more support, um, whether it's pat on the back, acknowledgements or financial support or collaborations or contributions to your own work. And that's something I'm trying to get into as far as putting myself out there and that engagement and it's still progressing not as much as I would have liked to at this point but that's where I'm really trying to push this next year as I'm kind of transitioning more and more into my enterprise getting debts paid and all that stuff um, so I'll let you uh, keep adding to that question a bit more if you would like but I just want to give you a congrats and a thank you and good job as far as me seeing some of those developments and updates yeah yeah no, I mean we're in the middle of it just really busy right now with a finalization and starting an apprenticeship so that's that's the next step and um yeah long walk to freedom um let me see if i can refer back to um those questions i had um so as far as the new project or initiatives on the horizon you're mostly focused on the cd home the 24 people cohort cohort the uh, apprenticeship program those are the main things on the table right now in the next year or so correct yep okay um, and then did you have any self-imposed constraints on what you've wanted to focus on? Um, self-imposed constraints are, I mean, to really stick to the, the finish line of one product, which is the CD Cajon and all its, all its different iterations, the full automation of the CAD tool chain, full automation of the build, including 3D printing of the entire modules that's in there too but that's part of that project when i mentioned the 240 people we have a lot of work to do to get to a level that would even qualify for what's what i described as distributed market substitution absolute minimum of 240 people can you go world class and with open source with 240 r d people working on that full time that's 240 a team of 240 that's that's pretty small for a world class product right and i'd like to interview is a big deal so where are we there so you can interject real quick is, uh, just to finish the constraint oh, sorry, so the constraint is less because the immediate thing is okay we got 24 people the apprenticeship works let's go into all these other things well let's make sure that we take this house product to the full scalability not only at the 24 person level but at the 240 person level which at that point, that gets you in a, in a territory of not small, but more the medium enterprise level. Like there's huge corporations, there's small, medium, and large companies. Can we actually succeed at the medium level? If we can do that, I don't see much much case for a huge corporation because we can be dis act distributed more at the sub-thousand person scale, right? Um, but that's where we, that's the self, impose constraint and make sure we get to that quality that allows this product to to redefine markets and be all inclusive i mean not like we're we're not trying to so-called capture the market we're trying to say okay let's optimize the field of construction altogether so anybody who wants to do it can do it and all the economics are getting distributed because we're keeping the information open maybe public benchmark the project so where, there, where, it's, where it's usually proprietary, you're doing a public do a benchmark or a public standard. Yeah. So people yeah. like will still want to do proprietary, but it's like, oh, wow, there's like this public standard. Um, I've, I remember reading a lot of books in college and this and that, but it's intriguing to me when you actually see like the standards actually practice and actually acknowledge. That's when it's like really serious and worth it. When, it, when a standard is actually acknowledged and not poo pooed or whatever else it's like whoa like someone knew what they were doing and it's lasted this long because they knew what they were doing and it works yeah and that's based on performance that leads to an interesting question so how do like all these people say that want to go proprietary with it that's fine now what's their relationship to it how can they just basically freeload so the freeloader dilemma at that point well 
fine as long as we have significant amounts of people doing the the core which constantly improves right so the, the people who are copying the business model are going to have to also make improvements or they're going to become obsolete so there's a mechanism even if you have freeloaders that that could still work as long as there is a very considerable core effort and that's why i want to see a core organization like OSE or some standards organization steward the standards steward the ongoing r d right and we're we're aiming to do that very explicitly through setting up campuses worldwide that do that like so okay so maybe this campus we might dedicate to the construction part there might be some other other campuses elsewhere for different kinds of construction but there's going to have to be a physical plant that actually supports and backs that standard so yeah we can have as many freeloaders as well people who want to go proprietary that's that's an interesting question because you'd think that oh well if we do the, develop the best product are we then just knocked out of business and then we kind of become irrelevant well that's a real question to ask because you got to be paranoid about survival as an enterprise but I think that's addressed because we build enough infrastructure going up to that like for example the say we have a full campus that's stable full infrastructure for 240 people that are doing that business no matter what because the the business model is there we're continuing to develop it we have to leave enough infrastructure in place so that even if there's um, adversary you know potential takeover by some other company that wants to take over this and uh, totally uh, totally trash the project they can't because they have to compete with us still I want to slow you down um, in regards to your infrastructure talk. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, whether it be a state government wanting taxes or someone wanting to yeah. build an empire and maintain an empire, yeah. it's going to take resources and value to maintain it. And at least yeah. this is part of my agenda as far as going forward, is I definitely want to heavily rely on your organization. Dare I say freeload, I don't want to, but I mean, you do have really good work. Um, but as far as what you got to realize when you're dealing with the real products and real infrastructure, it's going to take a lot of resources to maintain that. Yeah. And some of the incentives for me is to maintain a virtual repository that people can publicly access and want to stay on par with. But it's easier to maintain something virtually than realistically. And so um, I, this is my opinion, but I think you definitely want to focus on those relationships because it can be really challenging to maintain physical property and keep it maintained to a high professional status over a long period of time, where it's easier to find the right relationships to sustain the standards going forward, because you always have to consider like the cost value analysis. And because um, yeah. if, you, if you get the right people, um, you're gonna wanna make sure that they're compensated well enough so they're incentivized to keep going with it. Um, yeah. And, but I think the only um, way we can guarantee that is by in the four years we teach people the culture and once they actually get it then we can be pretty safe we did our best to teach people in the most effective way but if it's too hard then it means that hey the world's not ready for this yet maybe but also the cultural ha culture has to be economically sustainable they has to have that mindset yeah. but also the pragmatism of like um balances out um so i'm going to try to go forward so I don't take up too much of your time. Um, challenges and lessons learned. How do you approach overcoming obstacles and setbacks in your work? Yeah, it's, it's, I think the simple answer is problem solving ability, creativity. I mean, I call it sublimation. Look at that, uh, look at that page on our wiki so about neuroplastic sublimation. But the thing is, any entrepreneur who's always in a game is a lifelong learner. So you have to learn, adapt, get creative. And that's something that can be taught. So problem solving is a skill that can definitely be taught. Uh, I'm very confident that it can be and that we can teach it. But that's, that's going to be the secret. Uh, and, and try to learn, learn what, you, what you messed up with. What's the learning experience? You know, even uh, say the legal issues or whatever. Okay, well, what did that teach me? Uh, you know, uh, personally, I found that it's like, wow, this thing just destabilized me when some when a cowboy decided to bulldoze 300 feet of our trees on our land here. It's like, huh? 
well, it was kind of tough because it's right next to me, but it, it also showed me that, man, I'm so fragile because that just completely just knocked me out for like a month, over a month, because yeah. I had to deal with that, and I really had no tools to, to be prepared for what was coming. And so it's so always you got to say, okay, learn. Like, for example, with that, just as giving, you talked about templates, okay, mm-hmm. here's a template where you can go to the courthouse and, and get yourself a temporary restraining order against a thug. <laughs> That you can do it yourself if you know how. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, and like in my case, I was referring to past other cases with that organization slash company, and just other references, both the per- profile, but also what's worked and what hasn't worked, and how the process goes. Um, but also uh, another interjection of something I try to focus on with my philosophy. Is sometimes not necessarily problem solving, but solution create creation. So rather than trying to solve a problem, yeah. it's having a solution so the problem's never significant. Yeah, yeah, that's that's, that's like anti fragility, resilience. And in my case, um, I definitely value my relationship with you and value the work you're doing. But also, like I said, with my philosophy, I don't have a want, want to have too much real stuff per se because then it's easier for it to get hit, per se. But I want to have, like, the core things down pat, so it's very hard to dislodge me or take me down, but it's easier to maintain um, what I value at the end of my life and not get bogged down with things outside or varying out of my control. Yeah, yeah. And just notice that it's both, like, what, what we do. We have hardware, but we also have a, a huge paper trail. So yes, we're more... yep. Yep. Yes. And then also I would like to point out value value proposition. Note also that hardware is still 80% of the economy. So there's more value in hardware, in real tangible things, than in virtual things or in information. I mean, you can argue that information is the super source of it all. But in today's economy, like if you look at the numbers, software economy versus everything that's related to hardware, it's still about 80% hardware. Like we eat food, we we have houses, we drive on roads and use cars. A lot of it is hard. Yes. So if, if you ever like think about your strategy for your business, I would suggest, well, okay, if I'm got information or or social uh, services services, uh, yeah, how much value can you capture with that versus how much value can you capture if you have more tangible goods? It depends. But that's just a consideration to have in mind. It's also as far as. W- for me as far as my philosophy it's like what are my ending values upon my deathbed Mm -hmm. and if i get down to what i truly value it's easier to let a lot of other things go Mm -hmm. and be able to kind of fly and divert and um parlay or just deal with a lot of a lot of other bs that comes along as long as i'm true to those values it's pretty like with my legal situation i had the documentation prepared and I had this vision of how things would go. I didn't really want to pursue it because it's kind of been a <sighs> guy with balls, I guess you say. <laughs> Just, uh, um, but like staying true to myself and um, so forth seems to be working pretty well for me. Uh, it wasn't at first, but like, um, but just uh, sticking with what I felt like in my gut I had to do. And so far, it seems to be working out in my favor because it's kind of really turned around so far. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, just uh, anyway, I'll try to go to the next question. Um, advice for aspiring nonprofit leaders: Are there any resources or tools that you found particularly helpful in your journey as a nonprofit founder? No, that uh, it's. I would say there's a lot of good books out there, so read those, like "The Effective Executive" by Peter Drucker, or "Good to Great" if you want to really talk about impact. Um, so if you don't have friends that do that for you or mentors in real life, you can get those mentors from books. So that's, that's yes. like the, man, the most powerful thing. Uh, things, a lot of good stuff has been written. And then beyond that, integrating with that with complete radical rapid learning experience, hey, we're working on it, but you have to come for four years because it ain't going to be easy. <laughs> that's going to be our program. Yeah. Um, I actually have another question off the top of my head. Um, uh, kind of a preface, 
like I have a vision of like who I want to be and people I admire and I try and uh, you can get a lot from books but I don't want to style myself as being solely reliant on books and so I want to have healthy social interaction and stuff oh time's running out so this better be my last question but you are like if I put like 10 people up on my fingers you're one of the people I admire and I value what relationship I have with you and a lot of your work you're doing and so it's kind of curious for you um from about my age and you're like say your 30s to now and maybe moving forward who have kind of been the mentors you've had and who do you kind of still aspire to be some living at least but could be also passed away but who do you kind of like say like this is who i want to be as martian jakubowski but also these are the people i admire i want to be like as i progress in life people that i don't know or who are my friends both yeah so for for the people I didn't know, I mean, I was inspired by people like Mandela, Malcolm X, or Gandhi, Martin Luther King, those those types of people, or maybe Buckminster Fuller, until I found out he was pretty proprietary as well, even though he had domes. Uh, and now, okay, mentors in real life, I've had the privilege to be in a TED Fellows program. Now, I do have access to mentorship there. now. I have one mentor named Steve right now who, who I work with and yeah he's changed my life so, so if you can find a mentor that is at the top of their game and who is really willing to share with you because of a mutual interest and it has to be like a mutual interest it can't be a one way thing where they're just giving you something and not getting anything in return but that's like the most powerful thing that could ever happen it could be because that will provide you some guidance or the friendship or support when you're going to be going through some hard times or just just talking through different decision points and things like that so that's a way to accelerate learning like massively so if you talk about rapid learning like finding some mechanism where you get mentorship or something to that effect the next best substitute being books i mean if that's all you can get but but really try to try to find people out there who you can relate to and who you can envision that you actually have something to offer to as well, right? And then you can hit off some magic. So, yeah, there's... So, I, so and that happened only... That was five years ago, when I was 45. So before 45, I can't say I had somebody who I considered, considered a life-changing mentor. However, I would say that at the age of 30, I did, uh, more like 25 or so, I actually did um, have a guy who was a yoga teacher who did more like a lifestyle engineering kind of a course with, who taught me yoga, breathing, meditation, and Indian cooking, and that, that actually changed my life completely. Uh, that's not like a mentor type, but it was, um, but the effect on it, um, the guy turned out, I mean, he's not, not the greatest guy, but for, as far as the what he did uh, teach me yeah it was excellent but personally like, we actually uh, ended up not doing too great at the end but yeah that was a transformative experience so so one at 25 and then one at 45 so we, I think I had like I, I consider myself like mentorless for most of my life um, but I got a lot of insight from meditating kind of tuning out of the noise of society to be able to get at some more important things but yeah mentorship critical if you want to if you want to get farther than you are yourself <laughs> yeah okay i have another question and i'm going to limit myself to 6 30 no matter how it goes um but this question is uh, or a statement um so for open house party the mission is to empower people to create their dream home and help and empower them to improve their like well-being or quality of life and so um, I've gotten a lot of use out of your work and organization with Open Source Ecology and your wife's Open Building Institute. Um, with my program, what do you see as the va value or potential value that could be of service to your organization that you would be willing to say, like, I can use this from Chad's organization. This really helps us out. Well, there's two things that come to mind. One is, like, if you, if you can help on the, the scale modeling part. That's what I want to do, yes. That's that's a big deal it's like imagine that part of our kits for the rapid learning for the students is mm -hmm. just building that right on their desktop through the all the detailers you can do that take our full cad and you can do exactly that for the cd phone so that would be very interesting 
I want to pause you right now. I'm doing that. Wanting to do WikiOS development first because I'm most familiar with the REN model. Eventually, also Skylark. But as I get income and funding, I have a Zephy page. So it was like selling products and stuff, and it being the Wiki house as like a dog house, and Wiki house as like a fuller scale shed, or full scale house kit. Yeah. But one of the offerings I have is a picture of your CD go home that I want to replicate, whether that be 3D printing is the best option. Mm -hmm. Maybe once I get my CNC table laser cutter operational, um, that route. But I definitely want to invest or further understand your guys' designs, promote it, and acknowledge that it was open source ecology, open building institutes work. Yeah. I'm on YouTube and just when I do my programs and kind of keep my own documentation of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll let you go with that. Be able to, what's that? If you beat us to it, that would be awesome. And for us also, it's, yeah, we'll, we'll be doing that in-house. It's going to be part of that, as I mentioned, the whole infrastructure for getting this. Yeah, scale models are critical, including things that you actually do design with, real design. Okay, here's how the different model would look like, you know, different iteration, or even the entire, you know, think of the entire landscape, too. So think of FreeCAD, where you can even 3D scan the, the landscape, you can print your 3D printed models of the entire thing. You can go from FreeCAD into Bulldozer Toolpaths to do your <laughs> to do your actual grading on the site. I mean that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's integrating the FreeCAD with heavy machines and ROS, robotic operating system for. for it might be later on some of the more advanced features, but it'd be cool to do that stuff. For me, I just want to manufacture the house kits for now to make it viable. And then what was your second part, thing? So the second part would be then, of course, once we've got our program fully up and running and, and houses that we can we can build at a, scale, a time rate of every five days, of course, it will be marketing and you know, sending people our way, too. And like if you want, you know, if, if you're talking about making access to housing, empowering people regarding housing, you can send them send our way for the actual, actual, Hands on, hands on, real product, all of that. Okay. I'll keep those two in mind, and also keep in mind you guys with like about the newsletter I want to do, because I'm definitely keeping up to date with you guys' new postings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With that, I'm not sure if I'm going to get cut out soon. It's before 6.30. I don't want to spend too much of your time. Is there anything else you want to talk about during this interview? Yeah, I don't know. I think we covered, covered a lot of stuff, but it's really We did. To back to back to the grind and keeping inspired about it by keeping a, a positive vision about it so uh, recently I just read uh, so one book I was just reading it's, it was called The Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz uh, who's actually a venture capitalist but um, the thing that was in there that kind of touched me ah I forgot what, what the point I was there gonna make we we're talking about how are we closing up here oh, I forgot what I was gonna say hard things um, we discussed mentorship also the oh, two yeah, things that serve your organization yeah yeah psychology so as far as uh, keeping your psychology clear um, yeah like in terms of positive because you're gonna have ups and downs as an entrepreneur like that's because that book is dedicated to like the power you know, powerhouse entrepreneur oh I need to interject again I need to interject a thing Mm -hmm. um, so with Open House Party, I'm really focused on what you guys say is exponential growth in the nonprofit sector, but also some of the fascination of exponential decay with negativity. Because if you do exponential decay with the bad negative, it becomes a positive. And that's something I want to focus a little bit on my for-profit side. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I, I wanted to mention that to you as far as exponential decay and negative, like, negated. Hmm. That sounds like like anti-fragility defined in, in numbers. Uh, but anyway, the thing is, uh, keeping one's psychology through all the ups and downs, so, so having a way to relax or process or get support, that's that's important. But just really building that internal strength, because it's gonna be hard. I mean, there's, if, if you're the decision maker, you're gonna have to make hard decisions and so forth. So yeah, yeah. Keep up the psychology, positive psychology. I do have a request if you could link me to this uh, recording yeah. um, either way like you did last time I'd greatly appreciate it yeah. um, I'm just concerned it's going to cut out before 6.30 but in case that it's cut out I want to thank you again so much for this interview yeah. and your time yeah. uh, hopefully I can, uh, we can do more interviews in the future but I really appreciate this time that you offered me yeah yeah, definitely, definitely. and for me 
back to the grinder, back to building the house. I actually uh, putting an auger on a micro track so, so to plant some trees, so augering tree holes for the, the final house build. So I got to do that. Cool. And we'll see you next time. So yeah, let's let's leave leave it here.